going to have an operation next month. Um, it's not a serious operation. As a matter of fact, if it was anybody else, I would say it's a minor procedure. But it's not anybody else. <laughs> but anyway, in, in anticipation for the pain and suffering to come, I've been uh, reminiscing about the time when I worked in a hospital. I, actually, I worked in two hospitals in two different states, neither of which was Virginia or adjacent to. And you'll understand the reasons for the disclaimer later. Um, I was not a doctor or a nurse. Uh, I was uh, in the hospital I'm going to tell you about. I was a hospital administration intern. And as an intern, they bounced me around all the different departments to see what was going on, mainly wherever they needed an extra pair of hands. Um, and although my medical career was rather brief, uh, I learned a lot. Uh, for one thing, I, I learned about uh, fear and operations that when you're in the operating room, and I was in many, uh, watching what was going on, the reason I was there is when they take those little bits and pieces and have to send them to the lab, they don't call FedEx. They need somebody to carry it out. And uh, so I know that uh, when you're in the operating room, you are safer than you are sitting here. Because no matter what goes wrong, they've got the expertise and the equipment to fix it. And uh, I was there when they had, went into crisis sometimes. And what would happen is that nobody would miss a beat. Doctors there, nurses there. And the heart stops. And the nurse walks over to the wall phone. She picks it up and says, we have a code, no R3. Hangs up. And you can see through the window, you know, the cardiologist is walking down the hall. He's walking briskly, but not running. Nobody runs. Comes in, he checks the signs, he says, do this, do that, do this. The heart starts up again. He adds $1,000 to the bill and walks out. <laughs> Easy peasy, wonderful. You're safe as you can be there. Um, now, I, there is an operation I recall. I was uh, there when they had a, a rather unusual birth. I wasn't in the delivery room when the baby was born. I was in the building, though. And um, then, that this child was born with his heart outside its chest. I never heard of anything like that, but apparently it is a thing that happens from time to time, not very common. But right away they had to move the baby into the operating room, and uh, uh, I wanted to see this operation. I wasn't supposed to. I wasn't, uh, they didn't need me in the room, so I went around into the scrub room to go through the window and observe. And of course you couldn't see anything. It's a little tiny infant. It's surrounded by all these gowned people who are like in a football huddle, you know, and uh, so I watched him for a while, and it wasn't anything to see. So I went back and did some other work, and I came back and watched him. But what happened was, uh, this is very, as you can imagine, very delicate, very intricate work, requiring a huge degree of concentration. And the surgeon, and presumably his entire team, were there on their feet for 11 hours straight without a break, putting that teeny little heart back down. And I mean, I can't lay on the couch and watch TV for 11 hours straight. <laughs> so I, I, I'm in awe of that sort of thing. And uh, to, to me, it was all very heroic. And I'm telling you that story so that to add balance uh, and perspective to this one. Um, they also used me for patient transport from time to time. And they sent me down to the basement to pick someone up. And down there is where they had the MRI machine. That big steel thing. It always reminded me of, of a puff pastry shell, you know, the horn that they put. But instead of whipped cream inside, they slide people in there. And I went down to pick up this lady. She was 80 ish and uh, had, was very sick. And she'd come into the hospital with the worst possible uh, condition you can bring into a hospital. And uh, it, it, it's, it's a medical term known, which is called unknown. If you walk in with a diagnosis, you're just way ahead of the game. Uh, so she came in there, and for two solid days, she had gone from one test to another. And she'd been uh, poked and prodded and sampled in every sort of part. And now this third day, she was down there, and they had uh, pumped some dye into her veins uh, so they could take a picture of the circulatory system. But she was old and sick and exhausted from the other two days. And this was just a little much for her. So I got her, took her upstairs for another set of x-rays. And no, I had no sooner gotten her in the door when her heart decided it had taken enough abuse and just quit. 
So the uh, radiologist there, he calls the a code, and right away the room fills with doctors and nurses. I'm pushed into a corner. They bring in the crash cart that has all the implements and injectables necessary to bring someone back, and they did everything to her you've ever seen on TV, including the commercials, and <laughs> worked on her, and of course, the, the one thing they couldn't do was take the dye out of her veins, and so the heart never got restarted. And eventually, they, uh, they called it and wrote the time on the, on the chart, and the room emptied out about as fast as it filled. And I have, um, I'm still standing here, I've been with people who are dying, and I have been with people who are deceased, this was the only person I've been with during the transition. And she was killed by the testing, by the same people she come to for help. And, uh, well, I was not happy about the whole thing. And there was a nurse there cleaning things up. And so I finally figured, well, I've got to do something about this. I went over and asked her, what can I do? Now, can I help you t take her someplace? She's not going to leave her here. And the, uh, the nurse ran out in the hall. She came back and said, well, take her back to her room. And she said, I've, I've called to get you some help. And uh, I said, uh, well, thank you, but uh, you know, I brought her up here when she was moving all by myself. I think I can probably manage her now. And she said, no, the hospital has a rule that we can't have a male transporter alone with a female cadaver taking her back. And I've always taken great pride in my imagination, and I know about <laughs> deviancy and things. But I had some trouble with this one. I mean, you know, this was a busy hospital. And if you were so inclined, where the heck were you going to do anything? Where's the privacy? I mean, you know, what do you say when someone sees you wheeling a corpse into a stock uh, supply room, you know? Um, I don't know. But anyway, also, and, and probably even more, more, more uh, disturbing, was how frequently does this thing happen that they have to have a rule about it? <laughs> I, I couldn't wrap my head around it. You know, while I was thinking about these things, uh, the other guy comes up. And, uh, and we have her there on the, on the gurney with, covered by the sheet. And he says, where are we taking her? And I said, we're uh, going back down to, uh, to her room. And he says, no, well, says, that can't be right. So we wheeled her out over to the nurse's station. And he asked the nurse at the station, so where are we taking this woman? And uh, she looked on the chart and said, uh, you're taking her back to her room. Now, you never argue with the chart, which is possibly one reason why she was in that condition in the first place. And so we took her into the elevator and down to the floor, and we took her off. We got to the room, pushed open the door, and we went in the gurney. And there, sitting in a chair in a brown suit, was a little old man waiting for his wife to come back from her tests. And the other guy and I looked at each other, and we knew this was above our pay grade. It's not our job to tell him what happened. He's looking at us rather curiously, and we just slipped out the door. This all went to the nurse's station to report what was going on, and I started rehearsing for my deposition because the, uh, the hospital had just lost three cases back to back uh, from malpractice concerning testing, improper testing, and so I just knew this was going to uh, go somewhere. But uh, the, the lawyers were practiced, and so they, uh, they settled it. Nothing, nothing ever happened on that. And, and you know, I, I can tell you that, uh, as I said before, you know, the, uh, uh, you're safe when you're in the operating room. People do die in hospitals, usually before, after, or instead of an operation. But uh, while you're in there, you're, you're, you're safe. Um, and, uh, and people who talk about they would like to go naturally. Uh, you know, they really don't consider how unkind nature could really be. And so as I think about it, uh, I would uh, probably prefer a kindly accident.